be very fast here to allow the person patience. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to be here all the way until tomorrow, so it's still come for us. Oops. This presentation, so I'm Dalai Falinto. Here's Benoit Bousset. Hello. And we're going to be talking about drones controlled by a Blender animated file, pretty much. So the project starts as a, something that Pudifu wanted to implement. So Pudifu is this medieval thematic park. Think about a Disney World, but with castles and Vikings, Vikings <laughs> and fire and trebuchet. And they also have what you call the Cinecini, this open lake with a, with a castle where they're always trying to push the limits of what you can do with entertaining. So they have synchronized lights, synchronized water show, video projection. They have 20,000 actors acting at the same time. They have a dynamic set. And they were thinking, what can you do next? So how can you go from a place which at the same time hits very low level technology, animals, so per se, if at the same time the state of the art technology. So this year, they decided to come up with the Neupter project, which was a joint venture between the Pudifu and the ACT. Yeah, ACT is a Belgian company that provides the lighting for, uh, for Pudifu, and they were, they were asked to provide a solution that would allow to put a light show in the sky. And the solution was to use drones carrying lights. Uh, but many lights, so it, it's not possible to consider these all situations where you have one, um, one driver for one drone, and when you have 50 drones, you cannot have 50 drivers, and all of them must be completely synchronized. So the solution was to, to have drones doing autonomous flights to guarantee safety and synchronization. And of course, you need to prepare the path of all these drones. You need to prepare the, the mission. And the hard part here is not only to make drones and make them fly and fly, fly in synchronization, but they need to be entirely autonomous. And it's really hard to get a legal, legal authorization to have 50 drones flying with an audience watching them. That's why I have no <laughs> drones here. And this is something that no one's doing in the world, apparently. We have a few people playing with drones. They have this drone open source initiative by the, Blender, by the Linux Foundation, but people are still uh, having to control them. You know, Amazon probably can uh, intelligently navigate drones, but they can't uh, allow this to be happening on the, with civilians. So the main challenge here, and this is what we're going to be talking about, how do we go from a single hand control animated drone to a show where you can get all these flying objects. So what you see here, you don't see the drone, but you see the, the payloads with the lights, objects, with animated lights, and just magical, and how you do this from within Blender. Uh, yeah, to do that, first you need drones. Uh, and these ones are big, are big ones, big beasts. They can carry multiple kilos, they have 15 minutes uh, autonomy. Uh, they've been built on purpose for this project because no commercial drones would fit the requirement. We did not do the drones, but we, we made the tool to control them. So the requirements of our part was to allow the visual editing of the path of each drone, then uh, doing automatic safety uh, verification of the drones, for instance, making sure that they never can get closer to each other than six meters, never fly above each other, never can get closer, too close to the audience, and so on. All of these things need to be checked before exporting the file. Uh, a specific requirement also was the possibility to play the, sh the, the show in Blender, uh, in, in the tool, in in, synchronously with the real show so that you can compare if the drones are doing what they're supposed to do. And in, if not, push the button to kill them. Yeah, and of course, they're not playing live with them, with Blender, but Blender had the responsibility to tell, or the tool that was built for this uh, mission task had the responsibility of make, telling you that this is a safe path. You can animate these drones. No one should die. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody had this one button that everything just falls from the sky. So I, I was first uh, contacted. Then, uh, obviously, to me, it was clear that Bender would be the tool for that. And then uh, I, I joined with... Uh, Dalai, who is the expert of add-on, and together we make a team and we provide it the tool within one year. Uh, why Blender's object stores, I think I don't have to explain that. Uh, the critical point is that we have to access the source code to make further customization if needed, and we, we needed it. We needed a lot, we're going to show what, and more than that, Benoit for years was the main developer of the Blender game engine. 
It's still the person everyone goes to when there's a big low-level question. And more recently, I've been more involved in the Blender coding as well. So for us, it was really, use, was really easy to use Blender in that sense that we knew with whatever was the limit, we saw if a few of the other add-on presentations, you could go and extend it further, either talking with the developers or uh, getting our hands dirty. Mm -hmm. So we made this tool. Uh, here is a, a view of the tool. Oh, you can explain that? Maybe? Yeah. Oh, basically, we try to concentrate all, all, <clears throat> all of our tool in these panels here on the, on the left, right, yeah. on the right. Yeah. And we actually had, we even have our own panel. We get a few of the options there. And the important aspect is that we try to hide Blender from the user, but at the same time, we are actually exposing a lot of the Blender built-in features as well. So a bit different from the, from the project we saw, the microfluid project. In this case, I actually wanted the user to use the timeline. The timeline, you wanted the user to use the dope sheet, but you also wanted our own controlled environment. With our, your, our own handling of deleting, our own handling of moving, and what else you see here? Here you actually can see already this uh, environment, which is also part of the tool. So our tool has a few templates, so the mesh of where your show is going to be is part of the tool. So everything is using external li libraries if you have a different. Uh, show the next one. Yeah. Another payload, yeah. yeah. But next one. Yeah. So whenever we had a new payload, you wanted to make it fly, you simply would create. Uh, and your file to be used. So we even have the separation between the operator, the guy who would be creating the animation, and the guy who would be the technical guy preparing the, the tool. Yeah. So the workflow, we are not going to present the tool in great details because we don't have the time and we want to concentrate on the Blender side, but we'll still, of course, do a quick tour of the tool. The first step would be to, pre to define the payloads. It's a simple mesh, but we have defined what we call a payload protocol by which, by giving specific names to the meshes, the different parts of the, of the payload, uh, the tool recognizes that as being led and being lightable. So it will provide the tool to, to put a color on them. Once you have your payload, you will instantiate the drones in the scene. We have, of course, buttons and uh, menus for that. You can see here the, the drones. And then you go to the editing part, and there we use the visual visualizations of the path. We start. We didn't start from scratch there. We use a powerful uh, cool tool called cool, Motion, Trail Motion Trail from Bart Crouch. Thank you, Bart Crouch. We contacted him. He said he was to maintain it, but he has plans for a new tool. So we just took where he left and fixed a few bugs, quite a few actually, and uh, customized it for our own needs. So we see these already in red. It's an example of whenever the drone was exceeding the, the velocity limit for our animation. So, so we had this visual yeah. feedback tool that would really fit for this, uh, this task. Yeah. What, what you see in this uh, image here, you see the path of the, of the drone, you see the collision cage, which uh, surrounds the drones and the payload the, in, in yellow. And then you see here the, the red dots are uh, parts of the path where there is a problem. The problem being, in this case, intra-drone collisions. So they, they, they collide in this path. And then after that, the, the, the designer will, will be able to click on the frames, the keyframes of the path, even create new keyframes and drag the, the path a little bit. We can show how it works here. And the most important thing to keep in mind during the presentation is that this is a tool within a tool. It's an example of a compromise. Again, it's a bit different from what the microfluid uh, people did. You're not uh, hiding Blender from the user, but you're trying to find a compromise between customizable experience an extended experience, but within Blender. Yeah. So. Um, once you have your path set, you must uh, control the color, the, the light, because that's really the target of the, of the, whole, the whole thing. Uh, we provided a small tool to set the color of, um, of the LEDs, uh, to see, so that the user doesn't have to go through F-curve to set the, the, the color, the, the color uh, animation. But that, that is, there is room for improvements there, but at least uh, it works. And then when you all OK, you have uh, checked your animation, you export. That's a big XML file that contains the path of all the drones, and each drone will take the path that uh, uh, is relevant to him. Two things to note here. Uh, we only export the keyframes, so what we call it the waypoint. And that assumes that the drones have built in the logic to recreate the path from the keyframe, so. It's again one of the big advantages of Blender because we knew exactly how Blender was doing the interpolation, so it could have the same logic 
yes. in the drone, kind of we're going to show that actually you had to change both of them yeah, together. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for the for the light, we export a condensed uh, texture format that will be interpreted by a low level uh, low level firmware. Um, this slide here shows that the tool is compatible with high level animation techniques. What you see here is a chain. Uh, starting from the top level uh, with an armature that has a built-in symmetry. The armature controls the nerves, and the nerve controls the spline, and the spline controls each individual drone. So you don't need to manipulate every, each drone individually. You can manipulate them as a whole and create a very nice animation. The tool is made such that it's compatible with this kind of, uh, of technique. Um, and here, just uh, before I go to the more dynamic part. Here we see the interface of the, the castle within Blender. What you see in yellow is actually the individual drones with the payloads in a safe, uh, the safe region. And you see that since it's Blender, you can see with different cameras at the same time, you can see how the director look, how the audience would look, how different seats would have the experience. And also this is an ex a picture I took from one of the demo flies. So this is how the whole thing fit together. Now, again, we think you're more interested not about the specificities of the project, but about the workflow. How, do you, how does anyone can do any project within Blender? How do you, you know, just solve problems that you might face? So one of the main problems we mentioned that we are very happy and, and grateful to use the motion trail add-ons, but their color scheme was quite different, and so was their, uh, there, there are a few limitations. But just as Blender, most of the add-ons that you can use in Blender, they are also GPL. So we can just take them and change it. In our case, we actually change the color scheme to follow our limits. So just get red whenever it's close to uh, the physical limitation of the drones. And you can also analyze the individual frames. So if you click in a frame within the viewport, it just gives you the speed and the acceleration of that moment. Yeah, which uh, implies to resolve three uh Power three equations, quite complicated formula, but it's, it's there. <laughs> uh, this one is uh, something interesting. Whenever, since we're exposing Blender to the user, the user could be doing anything. And originally, motion tray had no way to update the motion tray, which is basically the motion of your object, if you just change something on the dope sheet or something on the F curve. So, what we did, we just add a bunch of uh, callbacks in Blender source code to actually just tell, for the, tell the Python script that something had to be updated. So this is the kind of thing, extensions in Blender you end up doing for this kind of project. Okay, this one is for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, we heavily use uh, the auto-handle algorithm in Blender when we do the animation. The auto-handle means that the user only enters the position and the time of the keyframe. The, the, the handle themselves are automatically calculated by Blender to make some kind of curve between the keyframes. Um, the auto handle of Blender is okay, it's kind of okay, but it's not good enough for drones. For instance, in this case, you see this handle here traverse the curve. This means that just before the keyframe, the drones will slow down, and just after the keyframe, it will accelerate an, uh, again, which means for a drone tilting. And tilting means it's not good. Because the, you did it. <laughs> because the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so that's not good for. It wasn't good enough for for us. So what we did, we put an additional constraint on the on the on the handle that the acceleration before and after the keyframe must be identical, and thanks to the the Bezier formula, which is quite simple, it turns out to be a set of linear equations that can be solved uh, recursively. So we set up a formula which gives this. You can see now that the curve has a much, much smoother form. Uh, and by the way, there is a, a nice, a nice um, uh, plus with that. If you, if you, if you add a new keyframes, oops, sorry. If you add a new, a new keyframe, for instance, here, the curve will not change, which is an interesting feature which is not the case with the old algorithm. Uh, of course, there is a price to pay, and the price to pay is, I think, quite small, but it needs to be mentioned. With the old algorithm, if you change one keyframe, the handle of the neighbor keyframes are modified, but not the one after. You see the curve here remains exactly identical. While with the new algorithm, 
the change to a keyframe propagates further. But the difference is small, and for us it was not an issue, of course. And this allowed us to have the XML representation of the path, just mimicking one-to-one -one the Blender keyframes, because there, it was a controlled algorithm okay. all over the system. You, see, you can see here the difference uh, in the 3D. You can see that the new algorithm will provide kind of a global aspect of the shape. I don't know if you can, okay. Next one. So I mentioned that it's very unsafe to have drones flying around and always need this one red button that if you press, everything just falls. But sometimes there is one drone which not necessarily uh, putting anyone in a risk situation, but maybe the battery is not so good, it's going down, maybe the GPS is failing. So sometimes you want to shut down one single drone. But the drones are expensive. I mean, you mentioned we're building them ourselves, so it's not like you can just go in IKEA and buy a new one. So what we're actually doing, we preview that for a few moments in your path, in the animation, you had what we call escape paths. So if you're failing, if the battery is very low, close to this point, we just say next time you go to the next escape path, just take the escape route. So if you see here, we have the, this is the main, main path here. And this one is the escape path. Yeah. It's just an example showing the principle of a, of a drone taking an alternate route. Yeah. So we have like one drone. Is that, this is only one drone, but two altern, altern, yeah. all, this alternate is, routes this drone for is the, the same drone. It's the escape drone. It's a ghost. It's a copy of this one when it takes the alternate path. The problem is, uh, since this drone is kind of connected to the original drone, we had a few constraints that we needed that Blender wouldn't allow us to do. First thing, first thing is, we want this new path to have the same initial velocity as the original point uh, of the path. So that's one requirement. The other one is we cannot change, we cannot let the user change on the loop sheet or anywhere else the original keyframe. Because otherwise you need to update everything, it'll be too much hustle to implement. Yeah. That's so forward. what we did was actually change, we created a new keyframe type in Blender, the Blender source code, which is a locked keyframe. So this keyframe cannot be moved cannot be scaled, cannot change, cannot be updated. So the moment you set this as a lock-in keyframe, you can only change via Python. So it can change, but only via Python. Or you can delete it, but if you do it, you, de you, you know it's deleted. We have a callback and just deleted the escape uh, okay. route from. Okay, um, let's go a bit quicker. Uh, collision. Um, you can have as many as 50 drones in the sky, and at, at any moment in time, they cannot collide to each other. Impossible to do in, in Python, obviously. So we use the bullet, which is, as uh, hopefully has been integrated into Blender by uh, Sergey. By Sergey, where is Sergey? The other Sergey. Our Sergey. Thanks very much, Sergey. A clap of <laughs> applause for Sergey. <laughs> he did. Well, he continued, but he did a wonderful job on having Bullet integrated within Blender, among other developers, helped as well in the past. So Blender could actually use bullet simulation just as we have on the Blender game engine, but these were not accessible via Python. Yeah. Because we needed in our add-on to be able to access these collision shapes and the collision simulation. Yeah. So three things we did quickly. First, we added a new type of body called sensor. It's a body that can collide but does not, does not produce any force. So it's a ghost, uh, which is perfect for detecting collision. We gave the access to the collision groups and collision masks uh, this is typical from a physics engine, and it basically means that uh, you can control very, very, uh, in a very refined way which object collides with which object. Uh, and then on the Python side, we uh, gave access to the collision pair. So after a, oops, after a simulation step, so after a frame step, from the collision pair uh, property of the rigid body world, you have access to which object did a collision in the last frame, previous frame. And also a function to cast a volume in the scene. And this we use to verify that no drones never flies above another drones. So we cast the volume of the drones down, and if it hits nothing, then, then it's okay. So just basically in, uh, extending the Blender, not even the C functionality was a little bit, but just to make Python faster. Yeah. People say sometimes Python is slow. It's not as slow. It's slow if you had to do all the collisions only in Python, but in Blender you can also count on having the C to provide a more efficient set, like a method. Yeah. Methods. Okay. Thanks to that, we can export uh, pretty quickly. Uh, quickly on this one, it's simple. Uh, I mentioned the LTC clock source. It's a, it's a wire clock, and there is a, 
a board that detects it and turns into a digital value. But there was no Python API for it, so we made a Python module to get the clock, and we simply set the clock to Blender to synchronize Blender with the clock. So as simple as that. So you could have the real show happening, everything was synchronized, the sound, the music, and the drones in the real show, but the Blender could get the same input, and it could see in the simulation within Blender what was happening yeah. in the real place. Uh, another add-on which has been proposed as a patch, I think, is the SMTP add-on. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, SMTTE. Feature. It's SMTTE. very common to have when you're doing uh, editing or special effect. Uh, not special effects, but editing, light, audio uh, mixing to work not with frames, but with what I call SMPTE. It's a format which says we have hours, minutes, seconds, and frames. Blender does support SMPTE on the timeline. So if you press something S, I think. Control T, I think. Control T. Control T. You get to see all your, your time of your movie with SMT, SMPTE. But Blender doesn't let you to input SMPTE anywhere. It doesn't let you see the input of the button as SMTP either. So for us, it was a requirement because the show itself is two hours long and the drone will just play part in a few uh, chunks of time. So you needed to know exactly what's the time mark to start and to end. So what we did, we patched Blender, I'm saying it was a patch, to allow for any, any time-related uh, input to be able to be shown as SMPT. Okay, there yeah. it is. And this is submitted as a patch as well, was, was under discussion with this, yeah. another topic. Uh, light programming. Just something uh, very specific is an example of how a lot of things in this kind of project can benefit other projects. So in our case, we showed the drone with, I think, 10 to 20 lights we have on it. We need a very specific way to have the user to have what we call selection group. So we could very easily go back to a specific drone and very quickly navigate within the selected light. So we have here just select one drone or three drones or all the drones, and you can store as a selection group. And you can play back all the selection group. You can record anyone, you can rename, and you can also play all the elements one by one. So go all the lights one by one, you can do changes. Yeah. This is happening. a generic feature, so it's not specifically powerful for us. It can work with anything in Blender. Yeah. It simply records selections in buttons and then store them in the file. And when you reload yeah. the file, the selections are still there. And as, again, as I said, since it is a standalone add-on, we're even releasing this in GitHub. It's over there to anyone to see. Same goes for the next feature. Just an example of things that can be done that help us, maybe help someone else to learn from that. I don't know. This is a choreography tool. Choreography tool. So even though after we built all the low-level tools and all the requirements, they were just having a good time recording and designing choreography, but they were having a terrible time making specific forms, circles, squares, lines. So we just built, again, a standalone add-on that just helps you to select a few objects and quickly create a circle or a square. And what you do is you just create this circle, and then you go back a few frames and see how they go from the landing position to the takeoff position all the way to the circle, and they can rotate and then go back to another shape, mm -hmm. and so on. That's it. So all, all, of, all these things we just mentioned are publicly available on our GitHub. And there's an uh, OBKind branch, the branch we called, so the Blender changes. Uh, there is some, a demo that I think is really... Time. Sorry? Yeah. Now let's see the, how yeah. it works and how it turned out to be. Yeah. Uh, please, can you please dim the lights? La Cinécénie est le plus grand spectacle du monde par la profondeur, par l'envergure, la largeur de la scène, mais aussi par le nombre des acteurs. Mais la Cinécénie manque d'une certaine manière dans notre esprit depuis des années de haute C'est-à-dire que le ciel est une scène qui est inexplicable. Je lui ai expliqué cette idée que nous avions de donner du relief à la Cinécénie en suspendant les écrans dans les yeux. alors parlé de l'idée des drones. Et c'est là que nous avons fait le chemin ensemble pour donner naissance au néo I was, you know, I think mesmerized or at least enchanted by the, by the idea because the next day Nicola came to me and asked me if it was really possible to get this technology here. A couple of weeks later I saw him again and I said yes, uh, I think I found a team and uh, we are where we are today.
such machine didn't exist. There are commercial drones available, but they're not waterproof. They're not able to carry a payload in the type of payloads that we want to use. They're not made to work in an event setting, so they can't fly synchronously with sound, with video, with light. Um, so there were a very large scale of problems that still needed to be solved. The audience doesn't see any drones, Compliment just experiences. Dans les années qui viennent, les évolutions technologiques offrant de nouvelles possibilités artistiques, says it's not non seulement ici, start. sur la scène de la cinécénie du Cul du Fou, mais aussi dans les scènes du monde entier. And they wanted to put their drones everywhere in the world. <laughs> We just have a few more pictures just before you leave, or, and, and in, you can later get the presentation online, you can get the link with more information about the project and the YouTube video. Just, I think, uh, I don't know which one is. No, hold on. F5 maybe? Uh, the one, the, yeah, this one. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. Just some final image, and if you have any question, you can start thinking. I don't have time. I probably won't have time, so no. Just final image. Okay. I just some some uh, daylight demos, and the last thing. So we have this very high-end technology, but we are in a castle. We are in this medieval park, and sometimes things will just crash. <laughs> but overall, it's it was quite good. What's your name? This is Ruben, who was in the team uh, doing the control software, reading our XML file, making sure that the drones implement it. Mm -hmm. Oh, and this is the control room where you get to see everything happening. That's me right uh, all the way in the end. There. This is Luke, the main operator yeah. for Blender. And they're using uh, Blender there. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, uh, Pudifu and ACT for the opportunity on working this project. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Hope you like it. Sorry? Yes, yeah. yeah.